Now, our next speaker, uh, I'll introduce uh, our distinguished speaker, Ahmed Ali. He's a Melbourne-based upper gastrointestinal and bariatric surgeon. He currently serves as the immediate past president of ANSMOS. He's head of upper gastrointestinal surgery at the Austin Hospital, Melbourne, and he's clinical associate professor with the University of Melbourne. Ahmed has performed over 2,000 bariatric procedures, and his practice encompasses gastric banding, sleeve gastro gastrectomy, gastric bypass, endotherapeutic techniques, and complex revisional bariatric surgery. Please welcome uh, Mr. Ahmed Ali. Well, thanks, Evan, and, and thanks, everyone, for attending. This is a really exciting event, but I must admit, I am feeling a little dizzy. This is really hard to follow Rami after, after this. We're, we're going to uh, go away from the practical and perhaps become a little bit more philosophical and uh, hopefully calm ourselves down a little. Um, so this is quite a sort of a broad perspective and really what I want to do is just highlight a few things that are happening in Australia at the moment in the area of surgery and the delivery of surgical services and that's sort of where I'm going. Um, but I do have a few disclosures at the beginning and I, I have been wandering around this morning before we start in the morning tea time and a few people have sort of sheepishly come up and quietly asked whether I'm related to this man. This man of course is Waleed Ali, who is best known at the moment as being the, the host and the anchor of the project. But I do want to make it very clear, uh, I, I'm not his brother. He's my brother. <laughs> and he's not that impressive. He can't even do a gallbladder. <laughs> Don't worry about the chip that's on my shoulder there. <laughs> I've got my own TV show too, so he can just get stuffed. But when it comes to managing obesity and, and, and sort of trying to work out who should get what and where and so on, there are a whole lot of guidelines around, but they're all relatively non-specific. They're general in nature. They provide some aspect of standardisation of assessment, although we've heard a whole new way of considering that assessment this morning. What the available therapy options, there's a little bit of stratification, uh, but really it conveys a limited sense of prioritisation or urgency or even really evidence-based type outcomes, but these have been the traditional means by which we've governed certainly surgery. And the surgical eligibility criteria, if you like, really are very historical now. They date back to 1992 based on an NIH consensus meeting. I, I would emphasise that was in the era of open surgery, when there was far more risk associated with surgery. And basically they go along the lines of a BMI greater than 35 associated with some sort of metabolic comorbidity and a BMI of greater than 40. So it was all BMI based. Just as Dr. Sharma was pointing out, there's some inadequacies in that. Um, but nonetheless, that has formed the rock bed of all eligibility for surgery uh, for decades and pretty much in all guidelines, uh, variations upon this sort of theme. But are we maximising the benefits for patients? Do we really know who benefits most? How do we attribute value anyway? Do we do it by economic means? Do we look at years of life? Do we look at mortality? What about quality of life? What about prevention of disease versus remission? Do we know who we're really preventing disease in? How do we measure these things? Have we got evidence for that? What about access to care? It's all very well to maximise it in one individual, but what if we're excluding a whole lot of people from care? So there's a whole lot of issues around eligibility and prioritisation and access, and there's a whole lot of dilemmas and I'm not going to give you the answer, because I don't know. There's no evidence really to tell us exactly who to, who to treat and with what. So where are we with surgery in Australia? Well, surgery continues to increase in numbers. We're now sitting at around about 26,000 primary procedures per year, and it does continue to increase. But obesity is a big problem. You're all aware of this. 60% of our population is overweight or obese. 30% now are obese, up to f nearly 5 million. And if you p use those NIH type criteria, it means there are about 1.3 million people that are eligible for surgery by those classical traditional type criteria. And uh, Michael, just acknowledgement to Medtronic, who provided this graphic to me many years ago, and I've used it many times. It's still very useful because I think it gives you a very good pictorial event of what that means. So this is obesity in Australia. These are those with a BMI of greater than 35. Take or leave a few sort of exclusion factors and inclusion factors. These are the ones that are indicated for surgery. And these are the ones we operate on. 
So about 1.5% of people who might potentially benefit from surgery actually go on and actually have any surgery. And that's pretty much international findings. We're not much different in Australia. So there's very little access, or at least there's very little use of surgery in patients that may potentially benefit. What does that mean in Australia? Well, a little bit like what Dr. Sharma was alluding to, if we were to try to treat all of obesity in Australia with surgery, it would take us about 177 years, provided no one else developed the disease. Even if we just limited it to class two and three, it would take us 63 years. So if you view it in that way, clearly surgery is not a population level interventional type strategy. We're simply not gonna be able to do that much surgery. We'll give it a go, but we won't get it done. It does help individuals though. Surgery is very beneficial for the individual that you're treating. At this stage, that's relatively few in numbers when you put it in those circles. So it's not likely to have a significant impact on population health. So are we really maximizing things? But the question I put is, well, could we actually have a bigger effect on population health? Could we aim for a greater benefit in that area, not just for the individual? Well, this is data from Alison Venn, an epidemiologist in Tasmania that looked at uh, Australian health st statistics and looked at the obesity numbers, but then put them alongside the association of comorbidity. And when you do that, it's a little bit like using a staging system, if you like, it's not quite the same as EOS. But when you do that, the numbers do fall. And so you start to reduce the years to treat. Okay, so our class three, if we just operated on that group, it's significantly less than our 60 years or our 177 years. Once you start to introduce other factors, not just BMI. There's been a number of initiatives in the area of diabetes, and this is a really major consensus statement about the use of metabolic or bariatric surgery in diabetes and the recommendations. I won't go through the chart, and, and it's important to understand this was produced by diabetes, diabetes societies, not surgical societies. There was surgical contribution, but this is largely from endocrinologists. And in essence, what they recommend is that bariatric surgery should be, is recommended for class three obesity and class two obesity with poor glycemic control, and should be considered earlier in the pathway of that patient, even in class one obesity with poor glycemic control and class two, even if their diabetes seems to be adequately controlled at that time. So they're shifting the use of bariatric surgery earlier and earlier and in a wider group of those diabetic patients, recognising the impact that surgery is having. So what if we just operated on diabetics? Well, now you start to see some really major impact. Imagine if you did this, that you could deal with diabetes with surgery, whether that be remission or substantial improvement, and we know it's dramatic, you know, within a few years. So now we're starting to have potentially a much greater population level impact by using that resource of bariatric surgery. And quality, uh, sorry, uh, cost benefit studies, if we're gonna look at economics, I'm not gonna dwell on this, but certainly if you look at di the diabetic population, you almost double your cost benefit ratios. And this is based on Australian data. So it would seem like a no-brainer. There's patient benefit, there's community benefit. Even if we agreed that surgery was the best treatment, not all obese diabetic patients will agree to surgery. I take you back to that 1.5% penetrance rate. And not all surgeons are going to agree to operate just on diabetic patients. I mean, this is how we make our money after all. Yeah? <laughs> Especially in the private system. So we've seen the circles, 1.5% access surgery. You'll have to look really closely up the back because this is the number we operate on in public. See that little black dot it just jumped in. Only 10% of patients get their surgery in the public health system. So in 2016, this is 2016 data, but it remains much the same. MSAC did a review that they uh, the ones responsible for sorting out item numbers and so on. 950 of 24,000 primary bariatric procedures were done in the public system, which is 10% of surgery. But even amongst them, 6% were actually privately insured. Only 4% of all surgery was publicly funded. 
And if you really want to play with the numbers, that's 0.18% of the eligible population. And basically, it's because we don't have any public bariatric surgical services. It's 15 of 700 public hospitals in Australia provide any form of bariatric surgery. Don't necessarily have a bariatric program, but provide some form of bariatric surgery. And as we've heard, it's the lower socioeconomic groups that suffer the most. And again, Venn's study showed us that 46% of people suffering obesity have no private insurance, 52% are in that lower socioeconomic bracket, and 35% are regional. We have to improve our public sector access in bariatric surgery if we're serious about delivering it to those that need it most. There's a real equity problem here. It also creates problems in the private sector because insurers keep increasing their premiums. I won't go into all the details of that, but that further reduces access to this important treatment. It creates financial burden for patients that choose to self-pay and they sometimes take undue risk. And I think there is a professional responsibility on surgeons to not allow or encourage self-paying patients that are high risk surgical candidates. There's the issues of superannuation access and also medical tourism, and even our politicians have resorted to that. So we desperately need more public bariatric surgery. The policymakers, of course, are worried about the floodgates. There's limited resources. How, who do we choose? How do we prioritise? Who do we do it to? How do we maximise benefit? How do we know that we're getting bang for a buck when we're using a limited resource? And that's very difficult. So some of the work we've done with ANSMOS, starting back in 17 when we had a summit, to just explore the barriers to look at various models of care. And amongst that, one of the really important barriers when it comes to policymakers is confused messages. Uh, different disciplines within obesity give a different message about what's important in treatment or prevention or whatever. And if you're a policymaker, that's confusing. It's also convenient because it means you can just play them all off one another and not actually do anything about it. In surgery, we have inconsistent models of care. We don't have consistent selection criteria in the 15 services around Australia. We're not consistent about what procedures are offered, what the care pathways should be. And so the policymakers, although they understand the importance of bariatric surgery, they just don't know how to do it, and they've got easy ways to deflect it. They get confused. <laughs> we followed up that, that summit by convening a task force in 2018 to try to get a single voice consensus to standardise approaches around delivering a public bariatric service and also then use this as an advocacy tool so the politicians could no longer say, we don't know how to do it because we're showing them this is how you do it. And that was nationally represented across a number of obesity stakeholder organisations and we produced a consensus document which was just for the task force use and we're now working with PwC to formalise that into a framework document on delivering bariatric surgery and we're hoping to complete the second draft of that and um, have that go back to the task force for editing and a final publication hopefully towards the end of the year. So what eligibility criteria did we come up with in this consensus statement? Well, actually you heard it all this morning and I promise you I didn't collude with Dr Sharma, um, but ultimately we used mortality as the hard point because that's really the major evidence that we have. And we settled on the Edmonton obesity staging system. You've seen these graphs already, so I won't dwell on them. But basically we've suggested that patients that are in the very low risk group or those at the very high risk group that probably have little to gain probably shouldn't get access to bariatric surgery in the public system with the limited resources that we have. Um, and again, just because of time constraints, I won't go through all of the, the criteria, uh, but again, we've had some discussion around age um, and previous weight loss attempts. But how do we prioritise, even if we've said these patients are eligible? And the consensus was that we would deal with established disease over preclinical disease. In other words, those sicker patients. But some of those diseases are more equal than others. We now do have emerging evidence about which conditions respond 
most in bariat with bariatric surgery compared to others that may be variable in their response. So for example, we know that diabetes responds very well in most cases, and there are predictors, but certainly, generally speaking, better than hyperlipidemia or hypertension, which have many other factors contributing to them. And so there is an increasing evidence base for prioritisation. I don't think we've got it perfect, and I think we need to continue to look at that. But the areas where uh, you could perhaps create a hierarchy are in these sort of illnesses, particularly diabetes and obesity hyperventilation syndrome. We've already talked about fertility, uh, fibrotic NASH disease, and joint replacement. What about preoperative pathways? The major part of the consensus here is that what a very valuable tool is to have a solid pre-education and preconditioning program, the purpose of which is to educate, yes, but also produce engagement with the patients. And yes, I'll be honest, this creates some natural attrition. But what you're doing effectively is taking patients who actually aren't that interested in getting to surgery in the first place giving them enough information to make that decision so that they then don't clog up that resource later unnecessarily. It also allows us to divert those patients into other forms of care that can be of benefit to them. It needs to be, oh, I don't know how that photo got there, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyone knows in September I tend to lose my mind, it's about the AFL finals. But yes, a multidisciplinary team, but importantly, networking these services. We recognise not every hospital is going to do every type of procedure or be equipped for it. And if we really want to maximise access, we don't want to uh, discourage services from developing. And so services are encouraged to develop networks with one another so that everything is provided within that network, including medical weight loss specialist expertise as part of that network. Because the future or even the now of therapy is combined adjunctive therapy, um, as Dr. Sharma sort of alluded to, and this model is scalable. So to summarise, maximising benefit for our surgical patients for both individuals, but also at that community level, when you have a concern for resource allocation, is to increase access to surgery, especially in the public arena have early recognition of those who are suitable and engaged towards surgery or who may benefit from other treatments, provide appropriate eligibility criteria, and we've based that on the um, Edmonton staging system, and try to reduce the burden, particularly of those diseases that we know will respond well. But non-surgical strategies remain vital in that overall paradigm of care. And thank you to our sponsors. <laughs>